thank you very much for that. I found the whole opening a very moving experience for me, so I'm thrilled and honored to be here and to have witnessed uh, that opening. Congratulations to the Green Party for organizing this conference today. I think it's a vitally important one, and uh, I just want to thank you for asking me to be a part of it. It's a great honor. I'm afraid I have to admit right from the beginning I'm an imposter. I uh, am not an economist, and uh, I have no intention of speaking uh, to the title of uh, the talk that was assigned to me. <laughs> I, uh, I hope you'll permit me to provide some context, provide that context from the standpoint of my perspective as both a scientist, a biologist, and an elder. So as a biologist, I tend to look at human beings not in short-term spans, but in terms of evolutionary time. Just want you to remember that life appeared on this planet perhaps 3.8 to 4 billion years ago. And of all the species that have existed in that time since then, it's estimated that 99.9999, four decimal points, percent of all species that have ever existed are extinct. Extinction is natural, it's necessary in order for life to evolve as conditions on the planet change over time. The average lifespan of a species is one to two million years. Human beings have been on Earth for perhaps 150,000 years. We're an infant species, and yet I believe that we are already creating conditions that make the possible extinction of humanity a very real one within the next uh, few generations. We evolved, the evidence uh, indicates we evolved in Africa. Africa was our birthplace, but we have now spread around the entire planet. And one of the great uh, keys to our success as a species has been our adaptability. We're not bound to a specific habitat or ecosystem by our hereditary uh, uh, limits. We, in fact, are very adaptable, and so we've learned to live very comfortably in environments as different as the Arctic tundra, as uh, uh, steaming jungles and tropical rainforests, mountains, uh, um, temperate rainforests, wetlands, prairies. We are a very adaptable species. And now we've entered a period of unprecedented explosive change, and we've marginalized the very people who can provide some context and sense of the speed with which we are, are changing. That is, we've marginalized our elders. Our elders who are a repository of memory, of, of culture, of experience that provides us with a sense of assessing where we are today. You see, the problem I believe we face is that there is a constant shifting of baselines so that we don't understand where we've come from and therefore where we're going. We, uh, there was a wonderful film done on uh, American uh, public broadcasting a few years ago called Empty Oceans, Empty Nets. And in one of the very memorable scenes, they had a very young, she must have been in her early 40s, skipper of a swordfish boat coming out of Boston. And she said, oh yeah, there's plenty of swordfish in the oceans. We go up around Newfoundland and we get our limit in, um, in a few weeks. She said, oh, I heard a few weeks ago someone caught a 200-pound swordfish. There are big fish still left in the oceans. And they cut then to a man that must have been in his early 80s, been a sword fisherman all his life, and he said, oh yeah, we never went further than three or four miles out of Boston. This woman was based in Boston and goes to Newfoundland, Canada. He said, we only go th three or four miles out of Boston, and if we got anything under 200 pounds, we threw it back. So the baseline has shifted, and to this young swordfish skipper, going to Newfoundland was a part of the way you did it, and a 200-pounder was a big fish. So the constant shifting in Vancouver, uh, we took for granted in our neighborhood, there was an empty lot that our kids used to play in with uh, quite a few trees in it. And then uh, after we'd lived in the neighborhood for quite a few years, we came, down, came home and the trees were all gone. A few days later, there was a big hole. A few months later, there was an apartment building. A year or two later, all the apartment building dwellers 
were living there, never aware that there had been a small grove of trees that they had replaced. And we adapt to that and we forget what was once there. We, um, my wife and I uh, um, have a, a cabin on an island and when we leave Vancouver and, and get uh, on the last ferry to, to our island, we rejoice because we can see salmon, there are herring balls, there are eagles, and we think, oh, it's so great to get back to nature. Then we talk to our neighbor, Dan LeClaire, who's uh, in his 80s, and he remembers when you could hear the salmon miles away. They were so abundant, you could hear them splashing in the water. When you could go out in a punt with a rake and rake herring off the kelp beds and fill your punt in 15 minutes. He describes um, an island that's unrecognizable today in his lifetime. But because we live in a fundamentally degraded environment of the city of Vancouver, to us, our cabin seems to be rich and we think, oh, this is what nature always was because we don't have our elders to remind us of what once, once was. I was born in Vancouver in 1936. My parents came through the Depression and they taught us some of the, the lessons that I've tried to instill in my own children. They taught us to live within our means. They taught us to save some for tomorrow. They taught us to help your neighbors because you never know when you might need their help. And they taught us that you have to work hard to earn money because that money is needed to buy the necessities in life. But you don't run after money as if having more money or stuff makes you a more important or a better human being. We were taught to feel sorry for people who got caught up in running after more stuff and flashy, flashy clothes and cars. Now, of course, we celebrate people who are rich. There are magazines and all kinds of programs about the very rich and, and we look to them as, as the role models of uh, people that we envy and, and aspire to become. Now we define ourselves not as parents, as churchgoers, as teachers or plumbers. We define ourselves as consumers. Our job in society today is to go out and buy stuff. It wasn't an accident or a joke after 9-11 Mr. Bush's first speech to the American public, in, in that speech he said, I want you to go out and shop. That wasn't a joke. They had to go out and shop because that's a critical element of what the economy is today. 70% of the American economy is based on consumption. The, that consumption is not about providing our needs, or what my parents called the necessities in life. They're, the consumption is based on our wants and there's no limit to what we want. And we've kind of got away from the idea that what we use money for is for the important necessities that provide our basic needs. What is the issue today? I had hoped there would be um, a blackboard here, but I want you to imagine this in your minds. Imagine the x-axis of a graph in which the x-axis is divided into 15 units and each unit represents 10,000 years. So the 150,000 years of human existence on Earth. And then on the y-axis is numbers in billions and that's a population. And what you find is, and, and I often tell uh, young kids to do this at home as an exercise because it's quite dramatic. You start plotting that and for 99% of that time, the curve is virtually flat on this, on this uh, uh, graph. 10,000 years ago, at the beginning of the, industrial, uh, uh, the agricultural revolution, there were about 10 million human beings on the entire planet. Agriculture heralded a huge shift in the way that we lived so that in only 8,000 years, that number had increased by an order of magnitude. By the time Jesus Christ is thought to have been born, it's estimated there were 100 million people. Now on this graph, that's in the last almost pencil width of time. And then in only 1800 years after that, we reached the first billion people in the early 1800s. And then in only, in less than 200 years, we reached 6.9 billion human beings in 2010.